discussion about authority. Last week we talked about uh, uh, God's authority, His true authority. Uh, as creator of all things, He has control and authority over all things. Uh, today we're going to talk about our delegated authority, but before we do, uh, I'm going to take a, a small rabbit trail. And as I was praying about the service today, the, uh, a couple of days ago, God brought me uh, to a scripture in Jeremiah, and, and it kind of ties in with everything. And it's in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 30, and it says, An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? And Jerusalem was about ready to get pounded and, and, uh, and come under judgment. And part of the reason for that was is that they had neglected God. And they had become very religious, very uh, self-indulgent, And in the midst of it, they had a form of godliness, but they denied denied the power thereof. And and there's a couple of things that are, there's three things that are with that. Number one, the prophets prophesied falsely. They only only prophesied that which would make people feel good, to incur favor from the the princes and from the people. And uh, secondly, the priest, they rule in their own authority, or in other words, they used their influence for their own selfish gain. And they did things the way they thought it should be done and not according to God's directive. This is the way I want to do it, and by golly, this is the way it's going to be. And the third thing was is that the people loved it, and they wanted it. And as we go back to when God brought Israel to to Mount Sinai, the Bible says there was thunders and, and lightnings and the people said, Moses, you go on up there and you talk to God and we'll, we'll do whatever you say, but if we go up there, we'll die. Well, the reality was is they, they wouldn't have died, but they sacrificed religion for relationship at that point in time. And in our nation, um, we've had a lot of ministries say some really goofy things over the last uh, couple decades. And we've had a lot of just, uh, for lack of a better word, heresy been taught. And people have used ministry to pad their own bank accounts and to establish their own power structures. But one of the things that's made it difficult is that people have put up with that. And they've loved it because as long as you do that, give me a sense of that I'm okay I'll go along and I'll support you in that. But you know, the last couple years, there's been a change in all that. People have kind of woke up and they've said, why are we doing all this craziness? Because society has reflected the craziness that has been in the church. And people have begun to repent. People have begun to seek the face of God. And people have have actually begun to open the scriptures and look at the word of God for themselves and say, you know what? No, this is this is the truth. And this is the way, and this is I'm gonna walk in this. And on one hand, it's been a a stain against the body of Christ because we've allowed a lot of dumb things to go on for a long time. But I'm encouraged because people are saying enough of that. And they're beginning to seek the face of God. And I, wanna, and I say that because I have great hope for the future. Because Jesus is going to be glorified in this place and in this nation. And he's going to use you and I to do it. Not just us and the body of Christ, those that are, that are truly seeking the face of God. So I want to encourage you. I've, I've talked to a lot of folks who have, who have they've just been dissatisfied with the status quo, and thank God for it. You know, thank God for it. He's moving on his people. And as today, I want you to think about that as we talk about our delegated authority today. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us to to embrace your word, help us to live by it, and help us to please you in it. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. All right, now, when we talk about delegated authority, we want to define our terms so we're all talking about the same thing. Delegated authority means the commissioning of someone to exercise the prerogatives of one higher in position in the hierarchy. Now, that that's kind of sounds like a mouthful, but, you know, we have a lot of experience with that. How many of y'all guys have a job and you're not the boss? Yeah, okay. And you go to work and your boss says, I need you to do this, and you do it. Why? Because they're delegating authority to you. And part of your job is handling the prerogatives of those that are above you. Okay? Some of you are business owners, and you have to learn how to delegate authority uh, to those that are, that are uh, working underneath you. Otherwise, you'll go crazy trying to try and do it all yourself. But over in Romans 13, I want to set a little bit of base here first for us. Romans 13.1 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, what that does not mean is that if you have a civil authority that you have to do everything they say. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. What it is talking about is civil authority, the structure of authority is given by God, and it's given for a couple reasons. Number one is to protect the innocent, and number two, to punish the evildoer. That's the role of government, is to make sure that people are, are very well taken care of and people are protected from those that would try to do them harm. Unfortunately, in our society, we have evolved from that to where the government likes to micromanage every facet of your life. And that is not what God has called us to. When civil authority contradicts God's authority, we submit to the higher authority, and that is God's word. That's why in Acts 5.21, uh, they said, we must obey God rather than man, because they said, we told you to quit talking about this. Well, they were, the, they were the civil authority. But there was a greater authority that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. Now, once again, we've, the idea of authority, uh, we, we have a tendency of relating that strictly to power, and power is a part of it, but it goes beyond power to position. Okay. Now, you can be uh, in, a, in a situation where uh, you're driving down the street and something has happened. There's a traffic cop out there. And that cop's like, you know, stop, you know, boop, you know. And that cop, irregardless of how big they are, probably does not have the power to stop your vehicle. I mean, they don't grab it by the front bumper and, you know. But they have the authority to, for you to stop. And so you, so you do, okay? Uh, they can say, I need you to go over here. Well, I don't want to go over there. Well, I need you to go over there anyhow. So we go, <laughs> we go over there. Why? Because chances are they know something that you don't, and that, there's a problem behind them, okay? Sometimes God brings people into our lives to direct us in a certain way, and sometimes that, that's a way that we don't want to go. But God knows something that we don't. And so we learn to kind of, mm, all right, all right. We, we, we talked about this years ago. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been behind somebody and for whatever reason they're driving like really slow? And, you know, and usually it's when you're in a hurry. And you know, the speed limit's 35 and they're doing like 20. And you're going, what is wrong with you? You know, and you're getting amped up, and you're, and you're uptight, and, 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 and you can't pass them because there's traffic going this way, or you got the yellow, the, the yellow lines that, that don't let you pass, and, and you're thinking, God, what is going on? Maybe he's saving you from something, all right? Maybe he's, he's protecting you from something. So, yeah. Now, uh, over in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, we're going to take a look at that real quick. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 1, it says, first of, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness. 
This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I, I, I put these two things in here because we should pray for those who are in a position to make decisions that are going to affect our lives. Okay? Uh, we have governing authorities. We might not agree with them. In fact, many times we might disagree with them. But they make decisions that affect your life. And we should pray for them. Okay? We should pray for them. Uh, you have an, many of us have employers. If you have an employer, I want to encourage you to pray for them. Even in, in times when you think they're doing things that you don't agree with. Because when your employer does well, you do well. If your employer goes under, you got to get another job. Okay? So begin to pray for those that are over you. Um, why? So you can lead a, <laughs> a tranquil and quiet life. Okay. Now that we got all that settled, let's jump over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're going to start... In, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, And uh, he, he being Jesus, called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the, the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff or a bag or bread or or money, and don't even have two tunics apiece. And whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave the city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from the city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel. Okay? Now, if you look in verse 10, it says, When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all they had done. Then taking him with him, he withdrew himself to Bethsaida. And over in chapter 10 and verse 1, it tells us that after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And so, and he kind of gave him basically the same instructions. And in verse 17, it tells us, and when the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons we're subject to us in your name. And he said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In both of these situations, understand something. The authority to go out and and preach the gospel, to, to see healings, to cast out devils, came from the Lord. They were not something that someone just came up with and said, I got an idea, we're going to start a ministry and we're going to do this. No, they had to be commissioned from the Lord. And Jesus said, even in the midst of all this, rejoice that you're, that you're saved. Your names are written in heaven. Could you imagine these guys? Now, the, the, it says, now the, the, in chapter 9, we know it's the disciples. We know these guys. We know who they are. One of them had a devil, Judas. He still went out and preached the gospel. But in chapter 10, we got 70 people. Doesn't tell us who they were. Doesn't tell us anything about them other than the fact that they did what the Lord called them to do and they saw miracles. And they came back and they were just, just beside themselves. Lord, the demons are even subject to us. It was incredible. You should have been there. You know, I was in there and this guy's like, ah, and I'm like, come out of him, you know, and they go back, you know, and they did, and, he, and they're in their right mind and it was incredible, it was awesome. And uh, what's next? Why did they see all that? Because Jesus said go and they went. When he said go, he commissioned them. He gave them the ability to do that. He gave this commission to people that were his disciples. So I've got to look at this and say, 
Am I a disciple? Do, is, is, is my life, am I living my life in such a way that the Lord can entrust that to me? If, if I am, then I probably should ought to be experiencing some of that. If I'm not, as we talked about earlier today, so maybe I'm questioning, maybe I'm, I'm struggling believing that. Well, if I've made the decision that God's word trumps my own, maybe I should press in a little more. Maybe I should seek God's face on this. Maybe I should begin to, to give myself over and ask the Lord, say, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Help me in my struggles. Okay? Over in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, it says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried uh, from his body to the sick and the diseases left him and the evil spirits went out. Or in other words, they, they went Paul and said, hey, listen, you know what, I, you're, you're a pretty busy guy, we've got a lot going on, just, you know, let me snip something off your clothes and I'll take that. That's where we get the idea of prayer cloths from, okay? And they put them on folk and they were, they were being healed. But also, it says in verse 13, some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. Seven sons of one Sceva, a, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this, and the evil spirit answered and said, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on him and subdued all of them and overpowered him and they fled the house naked and bruised. <laughs> Uh-oh. See, to exercise godly authority, we must be submitted to and commissioned by God. And you know what? I forgot to turn this thing on just by the way. <laughs> Here's some guys, they, they saw some miracles happening and thought, you know what, we're going to get in on this. Uh, we've got this ministry thing we're going into and uh, we'd like some folks to look at us and think we're something and maybe, maybe take a few offerings, uh, you know, get my jumbo jet or, you know, private plane or whatever. My, and they said, you know, we adjure you in the name of Jesus that this guy's talking about. And the Spirit says, I don't know you. I don't have to listen to you because you have your own authority. And I don't submit to your, I only submit to one authority, and that's God's. And then it jumped on them, beat them up, took their clothes off, and kicked them out in the street. How'd you like that for a Sunday service? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I'm thinking about going to this church over here, and you know, and hey, what's all that commotion? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Strike up the band. We need, a, we need a distraction right now. No. If, if, if you're going to put yourself out there, make sure you're, you're in right relationship with the Lord. And if you're not, all right, commit yourself to doing what it takes to get, to get there. See, a lot of folks in the body of Christ are, are scared to death of the devil. They're scared uh, of running across somebody who may be demon-possessed, or they're scared to, to run across somebody who, who may, maybe they'll ask them for prayer and they don't know what to do. Well, if you don't know what to do, you seek the one who does. And in God's Word, it tells us how to deal with these things. And I want to tell you something. Uh, the devil is a defeated foe, all right? He has no authority. His authority has been stripped of him at the cross. And you, in right relationship with him, all right, he has to leave. And you want to live your life in such a way that when you walk down the street and he sees you coming, he's not sure if it's you or Jesus because the Spirit of God's inside of you, okay? Okay? Now, I will tell you this, okay, and I have seen this happen a lot of times. Uh, once you get the understanding that Satan is defeated 
and that he has to flee, sometimes you're like, bring it on, you know. And that fear turns into boldness. Now, we don't go looking for trouble, but when trouble does come, we deal with it. Now, over in Revelations chapter 2, In verse 25, he's talking to the uh, church in Thyatira. And he says, What you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. So I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, as we go look at the different messages of the churches, they, there's a lot of things that are applicable to those who truly follow after the Lord. Okay? And one of the things is, is that if we are faithful and we overcome, and the biggest thing we have to overcome is ourselves, and we overcome and we keep his deeds, he says, I'll give you authority over, over the nations. That tells me that in the end, when we stand before God, we enter into his kingdom, we're not floating around on a cloud playing a harp. There's work to be done. There's things that are going to take place. Now what they are, the Bible does not tell us specifically on that. But what he does say is that if you're an overcomer, if you stay faithful, if you do the things he's called you to do, there's some authority he's going to give you. And if he gives you authority, there's got to be a reason for it. Okay? Now, uh, what he uh, gives an example of is out of Psalms uh, 2. We're going to take a real quick look at that. Psalms chapter 2. It says, uh, I'm in Proverbs chapter 2. That ain't going to work. Psalms chapter 2. Yeah, it should be. It says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointing, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. That's what the world says. You church, you guys are a bunch of nothings. Uh, God's nothing, he's a myth, and we're going to fight against God. And it says what? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He'll speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I've installed my king on Zion, uh, my holy mountain. I'll tell the decree of the Lord, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Then he goes on to talk about all the different uh, things that he had talked about in Revelations. Now, the thing of this is, is he says, I, will, uh, I have received authority from my Father and I will give him the morning star. The morning star just simply means governmental authority. That's what that word means. Now, there is something to be said for what God has in store for us. Once again, we don't necessarily know the, the details of it, but the Bible does say that we are to rule and reign with Christ. That means there is some delegated authority that he has for those who submit themselves to him. Now over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, See how great a love the Father uh, has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it didn't know Him. Behold, now we are children of God and it has not yet appeared as yet what we, we will be. We know that when He appears we'll be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So, not really sure uh, what's going to happen after the judgment, after we enter into uh, 
the new Jerusalem, God's kingdom. But what I do know is that we will be like him because we will see him as he is. What we do know is that the Bible says that there will be things to be done and our authority, our delegated authority is influenced by our submission and obedience to him. We're God's children. Now, um, many of us ha have children, or we all know somebody who does. And as a parent, one of the things that is reasonable to expect from your children is for them to live a responsible life and to do the things that you ask them to do. If you went to your child they maybe they're six, seven years old, and you say, uh, you need to clean up your toys. And they say, take a hike, old man. It should not go well for them. See, God calls us to live in, what well, we, we sang about earlier today, faithfulness, righteousness, holiness. And sometimes we find ourselves saying, take a hike, old man. I got things I want to do. It does not go well for us at that time. Because whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And that word chasten means he takes you to the woodshed and <laughs> gives you a whipping. Okay. But it says we... When we know him, everyone who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. I want to encourage you. Uh, we find ourselves many times throughout the course of our life thinking, is it really worth serving him? You know, I, my, my friends are going out and they're, they're doing all these things, my coworkers, and they come back and they say how much fun they had. And it's like, you know, and I'm thinking... Wow, yeah, I used to do that. And, and, you know, is it really worth living a holy life? Yes, it absolutely is. Because one of the things about the past is sometimes we have this thing called amnesia. You know, we think, oh, man, the good old days. There was nothing good about them. Oh, man, I remember back in the party days, we'd go out, we'd party our brains out, and I remember sticking my face in the toilet, blah, 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 blah. Oh, what a great night. No, it wasn't. I wrecked my car. Let's pray about those things. Leg. I killed half my brain cells. What a great time. No, it wasn't a great time. It wasn't. Okay. What a great time is, is forsaking sin and purifying our lives and walking with the Lord. Not only is it great for this life, it's great for the one to come. Amen. I have never had a young person come to me and say, you know what, I, 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 I don't follow God because my parents were such good Christians. I've never heard anybody say that. You know, my, my, my parents were not hypocrites. They were, they were righteous. They, they, they did what, what the Bible said. They, they, lived the, they lived the good life. They did their best. And so I'm not serving God. I've never heard that. See, your life is important. And the decisions that we make, and we're going to talk a little bit about this next week when we talk about God's sovereignty. The decisions that we make in life are very important, not only to ourselves, but to those, those around us. In Titus chapter 2 and, and verse 11, it says, uh, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. This is what God's instruction to us is. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. 
our submission and obedience to the Lord puts us in a proper place to speak and to exhort and to reprove with all authority. Why? Because we have credibility. No one likes to be told uh, what the Bible says by someone who doesn't live it. Okay? Um, Our authority, though, is not being obnoxious. That is not speaking with authority. All right? Or an authoritative tone. There's a lot of people who will speak with an authoritative tone who have zero authority. They'll try to present themselves as having it. That's why the Bible says you'll know a tree by its fruit. But our authority comes through a right position with the Lord. Okay. See, in God's kingdom, both now and later, we have responsibilities given to us by God himself. He gives us these, these responsibilities. He tells us, I want you to forsake sin. I want you to, to walk in righteousness. I want you to tell people about me. And, and you'll, go to, you'll go throughout life and people say, well, what gives you the right to tell me about the Bible? God does. Since he created everything, yeah, he, he gave me the right to tell you that about, about him. Well, I think that's a bunch of baloney. All right, that's up to you. Wow, that's, you know, that's, a, that's just a, a rotten, man-made, mean-spirited religion. Okay, God loves you. He sent a son to die on the cross for you so that you can be forgiven of your sins. I don't see the rottenness in that. I don't understand the meanness in that. Well, you're talking about judging. He's going to come back and he's going to judge the world. Well, yeah, that is true. That is true. But you know what? You can choose to not participate in that by giving your life to Christ now. See, we, we have the authority to speak the truth in love to people. We have been commissioned by God for that. And I realize that it's very difficult uh, to do uh, at times. But I want you to think about it this way. If you've seen somebody walking down the street and there was a big old hole there and they were gonna, they were gonna fall in that hole, okay? Maybe, maybe, maybe they, they can't see, maybe they're blind, all right? We'll make it easy. And they're not able to see and, and uh, they got their little white stick out and they're you know? And uh, there's a big old hole there and they're headed right for it. And you say, well, you know, I, I, I'd like to say something but I don't want them to get mad at me. No, you wouldn't think that at all. Because you recognize the reality of what's going on. It's no longer conceptual. The reality is, if I don't say something to this person, they're going to fall in this hole and they're going to get very gravely injured. The reality is, is that if people don't know that there is salvation in Christ, they'll continue in their sins, and when they stand before God, they'll be found lacking. Now, does that mean you put a sandwich board on and go stand on a street corner and scream at people to repent? That doesn't usually work out too good. I'm sure it's worked out somewhere. I just never really heard of it. But what it does mean is that as we're living life and the Spirit of God moves on us and says, I need you to talk to that person and and tell them that, that I can help them, that we do it, okay, that we do it. And we find that when we begin to walk in the delegated authority that he has given us, we find the joy and the peace that we've been so so longing for. Because now we're allies with the Holy Spirit and not um, counter to him. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of this next week when we talk about God's sovereignty. Because a lot of folks have a very misunderstanding of what that word means and we're gonna we're gonna discuss that next week so all right well lord we do thank you for your word today lord we thank you that you've entrusted your people with with different things um and lord help us to be faithful Help us to understand that the things that you say for us to do are strictly done because you entrust us with those things. And Lord, that when we say yes to you and we 
We do the things you've called us to do. It puts us in right standing. And we appreciate that, Lord. I ask that you would give us hope, give us a, a vision for, for the future, not only for this nation, Lord, but for this world, but even more importantly, for our families and our communities. We can talk about all the things going on in the world, and, and that's fine, and that's good, and it has its proper place. Lord, we live in neighborhoods and we live in communities. And we ask that you would help us to be faithful to where we're at. So that, Lord, in that day when we stand before you, we would hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of the Lord. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If, if you're in need of, of a prayer <clears throat> for anything, uh, come on down, let us, let us pray for you on that. It is an awesome day. Looks pretty good outside. Uh, Bible study Friday, Holy Spirit. And next week we're going to talk about God's sovereignty.